This is Women in Music with G Fire Podcast, episode number 25 with singer songwriter Rosie Flores. Rosie Flores, welcome to my podcast. Thank you, G. Fire. It's, it's nice to be here. I like your background. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I like it being, uh, well, this is only an audio podcast, yeah. so people yeah, won't, won't see this, yeah. but uh, yeah, I've got the, the space oh, one, so it looks like I'm flying in from another planet. Yeah, we're going to the moon. Oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> away again for some reason i i'm not comfortable with zoom i always have problems with it but um that's why i said yeah let's just you know have enough time that we can get enough stuff so i can edit it into the the fabulous podcast it's going to be okay cool so you are my first podcast uh interviewee since we found out that biden harris are going to the white house well, I'm not a Trumpster, so I'm doing the happy dance. Yeah. Most of my friends aren't Trumpsters. Of course, they're, I'm sure they're upset, like they're we were. They're upset people, but I'm yeah. not one of them. I'm, I feel relieved. Like um, I feel like uh, somebody took the gun away from my head. <laughs> wow, I hadn't heard that analogy. I, uh, the one I liked was exactly it feel how it felt. It, it feels like we just ended an abusive relationship we've had for four years. Yeah, I mean, there's a million of analogies we could come up with that describe being relieved. Yeah, and they're all pretty uh, extreme. Yeah, and to feel uh, the feeling of freedom again. And yeah, and, and hope. Yeah, freedom and hope and... Uh, well, I w I've always had hope that that I never lost. I always had faith and hope, but I didn't feel free and I felt captured and um, like somebody had their hand on me and wouldn't let me go or a gun to my head. You know, I felt captive. And uh, but I always have hope. I'm one of those half uh, the glass ha is half full of water okay you know? good that's good I uh, I admit I wasn't that hopeful for a while there <laughs> well, see we're all different we're all made out of different DNA and have different backgrounds and but um, I'm glad you're feeling hopeful now I am glad as well um, so uh, let's get around to my podcast questions where are you originally from San Antonio, Texas. I was born there in 1950. Oh, wow. So okay. I'm a purebred Texan. Um, I, we stayed there till I was uh, nearly 12, and then we moved to, my father moved to the post office in San Diego, and uh, we loved the beach, so we wanted to live there, and the weather was great. And but they bought a home, and I, so I went to school there, and um, I lived there all the way until 1988 when I moved back to Austin. Wow. To become part of the music scene here. But we came back to visit, because I have a lot of relatives in San Antonio, so we would come back every other month. We'd get in the station wagon and drive through the desert and um, and come back and visit for about a month. So I really... I hung on to my Texas roots and uh, my family and and just everything wonderful about Texas. So I've been, uh, you know, I've had it very, very dear to me. But I also miss, now that I've been here for uh, going on 15 years at a, at one long, because I've moved here, actually moved here three times. Really? And then you moved back to California? I would go back to California, and then I came back here, and then I came back again to join Asleep at the Wheel for nearly a year, and then I went back to L.A. for a short time, and then I moved to Nashville for seven years. Oh, really? Yeah, and then I, I was going to move back to California. I wanted to live in Joshua Tree, because I've always had a uh, place in my heart for the high desert, and it's just so picturesque, and it makes me feel a certain way that nothing else makes me feel um 
you know, environmentally anyway. And But I got stuck here in a pleasant way. I came back to do South by Southwest. Okay, what year was that? Huh? Just, just recently? 2006. Oh, 2006. Okay, got it. Cool. And so that was 15 almost 15 years ago, and I stayed ever since. I just, uh, I don't know, something grabbed me, and I uh, i was trying to heal from my mother's death and uh, breaking up with a boyfriend. I wasn't feeling too good, but this place has, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Austin has a, a real healing vibe to it. Uh, the first time I came here in 88, it was to uh, get over a romance that went south. And uh, it just has become my happy place um, up until lately. And, you know, I just, I don't have a happy place right now. Uh, I've been very blue through the um, pandemic, so I really don't know where my happy place is. I'm hopeful that I will find it, though. I'm hopeful as well. I don't know if I might move to back to California now. I mean, you're a big girl. You can do whatever you want, really. <laughs> well, I'm only five foot three and a half, but yes, I could still do what I wanted to. <laughs> and I weighed myself the other day and I went 106, so I'm really not a big girl, but I am a grown up and I can make choices and doggone it. I hope I make a good one and I hope I end up in a place that feels happy to me because I want to create, I want to put myself in a situation where I can go back to painting oh, and wow. finish and finish writing my book that I've been working on for 10 years. Nice. And, which is, uh, it's called Wacky Truck Stop Candy and Road Stories, and it's uh, a collection of candy that I've, I've gotten through um, the truck stops and just little road stories and experiences that I've had, you know, that are some funny, some tragic. Um, and I love painting. And uh, right now I'm having a, a hard time with writing and painting because I have really bad cataracts and I'm trying to save up money and I'm trying to go to different music organizations that help uh, do musician grants. And I may even do a, a GoFundMe page because it's getting down to the wire and my eyes are getting worse by the day. Oh, wow. And I'm trying to raise the money before the end of the year or at least by... Uh, in a, within a couple months, you know, so that will help me a lot if I can see well. Yeah, I think know. that would help everything, right? Yeah, I'll be able to create better, and I can see the neck on my guitar better, <laughs> and charts in front of me. Yeah. You know, that, that's a real nightmare for me, and it's very frustrating, <laughs> to say the least. So that, that getting my eyesight fixed will help get me closer to my happy place. But uh, certainly, you know, uh, Kamala and and Joe, uh, hopefully the Trump people won't screw that up. Uh, but them taking over and being two sane people with sane families and compassion uh, for humanity and, and the world, uh, you know, all that, you know, just me knowing that somebody... Uh, that's running our country cares about the same things I care about will be sort of like a warm blanket that goes over me when I go to bed at night like one of those weighted blankets you know oh yeah it will be like a weighted blanket and I can sleep better you know and hopefully everybody will get a, a vaccine when we're needed and we can go back to the norm I like to picture that that'll happen again I'm hoping we're, we're all again to me, Saturday was a big turning point, and yes. I didn't realize how stressed I was until afterwards. All right, yeah. I was I, I, because you know I, I was like all of a sudden really tired. Yes. Like Saturday night, you know, I was, I was just I guess busy celebrating all day. <laughs> right. I was dancing in the streets. Did you see my happy dance I, I did on put it up on Instagram? Um, I will definitely check that out uh, later today. It's on Facebook and Instagram, but I got, I got some haters, uh, you know, but most of it were, were all my friends that were like, yay, you know, but um, I was silly. I was like bouncing up and down on my couch 
<laughs> and um, I'm on this mold cleanse diet right now because I'm trying to clear out from what happened to me a, a year ago, and they found um, mold in my in, in a urine test, so I still have mold in my body. So oh wow, it's really severe cleanse taking all these supplements i can't drink alcohol no sugar no gluten no cheese nothing except for you know grass-fed uh beef and wild-caught fish and and healthy vegetables and so i think that's why i ended up losing more weight than i wanted to lose but i think i've lost more from not drinking alcohol but let me tell you what (laughs) I was. I had to calm myself down. I was just bouncing up and down on the couch, scaring my cat, just like going, I can't believe it, I can't believe it. You know? <laughs> and then I was like, then my eyes would tear up and I would just like, you know, so I like, you got to calm down. So I took a shot of tequila and it really did work. <laughs> I said, this is medicinal. It is medicinal. And, yeah. And you know, we I all have to celebrate in our own way and I... That sounds fun. (laughs) I did not see one thing wrong with it. I just, all of a sudden, I was actually kind of a little bit more chill and, and, you know, kind of in the groove, you know, and, but watching those speeches, they had a lot of important things to say. And I I loved what Kamala said about, you know, I may be the first vice president, but I'm not going to be the last. Oh, yeah. I love that. And. How? I worded that wrong. I may be the first female vice president, but I'm certainly not going to be the last. Yes. It was something like that. So you could see all the little girls in the nation going, oh, I could do that. You know. And of every race and every, you know, every whatever race. creed. Yep. Everybody's got a shot now that she's done it. Yep. I, and yeah. we'll, I think we'll, you know, I like her attitude and... She's got a good sense of humor. I know. She, yeah, and she's bright and she's tough. Yeah. She's, you know, she's not going to let people get away with stuff. Um, I guess she's proved that already. Oh, she has done a good job, and I expect her to, to enjoy more Kamala uh, yeah. dealing with the uh, the other side. <laughs> yeah. I love her expressions. Her expressions. She, she reminds me of one of my cousins that I grew up with, actually. But um, she we'll could say favorite aunt or something, you know, doesn't she seem like somebody's favorite aunt or. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, now, when did you first start writing songs and being a singer songwriter? Did you start early or did you start as a I, singer and then develop later the songwriting? My path um was started my path was just laid out to me when I was a kid and uh, my father um, loved music and he found out we could sing so he went and got a two-track tape recorder oh wow and it was about you know starting around seven and eight years old we started sitting around the kitchen table and recording songs we'd grab the uh, there there was a magazine back in the 50s called uh, the hit parade and it had all the lyrics to all the hit songs and you can you could, you know, that was before they had records that had the lyrics out, so it was perfect. You could sing along with your favorite records, you know, and or the radio. And so we would just look at those lyrics and record songs, you know. And one of them is actually hearable on my Rockabilly Philly record. I'm singing, um, I'm going to sit right down and write myself a letter. But I'm like seven years old, you know. And, Aww. I put that on there as a bonus track because the whole vibe of the of my rockabilly Philly record was I'm going back to where I started falling in love with music when I when it was rockabilly was what was happening and Elvis and Buddy Holly and you know swing music and uh, we would walk down the street and we would see rock and roll bands in the garage you know oh, wow. and my friends my parents had friends that were getting married and we would go and there would always be a rock and roll band and I would stand in front of the stage and I was just drawn to it like a moth to a flame you know and so by the time uh I was 13 I ended up in a girl group Mm -hmm. we did three-part harmonies and then by the time I was uh 15 my brother had learned how to he learned how to play the guitar and had a band in the garage and um 
I would try to sit in with his band. And uh, right along that time, around 1965, Bob Dylan came out. Oh, yeah. With like a Rolling Stone. Once upon a time, you moved so fine, through the bones dying in the prime, didn't you? It's like the first rap song, you know? But everything <laughs> that he had to say was important to me. And I was like, yeah, I feel that way. And it was like, all of a sudden, it was like the voice of my generation. And, you know, I thought he, and I still love his voice. I just thought it was like, so unique, you know? And um, he doesn't sing out of, out of key. You know, he doesn't sing off pitch. He's a real singer. That's just the way he he uh, interprets, you know. It's almost like talking. It's almost like rap, really. Yeah, right. Um, you know, like Johnny Cash, you know, he doesn't sing off key. And he's like practically talks when he sings. And maybe that's why I love Johnny's songwriting. But I, um, I asked my parents if I could get a guitar. So um, they got me one, but I had to pay it off at... We got it at the music store and I had to pay it off $10 a month for four months. It was a $40 gut string guitar. And I babysat and I paid it off. And I started getting lessons from my brother. And um, I started learning all the, well, actually, I started learning before I had my own guitar. And he got tired of loaning me his. So I was like, I need my own guitar, <laughs> you know. So um, after I had it, that's when he would come. And I would say, hey, I'm writing a song. You know, I have, you know, uh, a verse. Will you help me? And he would say, yeah, that's cool. You need you need a chorus now, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you need a bridge. And he would show me, you know, how to do it. My uh, talented brother was a great writer. He was a great kind of poet. And um, he got a, would win an award in high school for journalism. And he's always, uh, you know, been a, a very talented person living his life as in, as transgender woman now mm -hmm. uh, but it hasn't really actually kept you know marla hasn't really kept up with being uh creative and you know trying to i don't know what's the word to be ambitious with it okay like so I, she uh, she, you know, she kind of stopped the the process process you know i think you know when she uh uh, decided to change her life and I don't know it's it's always been a little bit sad to me and um, our politics are you know completely opposite believe it or really? not yeah so she's like a Caitlyn Jenner kind of kind of yeah you know because yeah. I never quite understood why anybody that was LGBTQ yeah would follow him <laughs> you know, I mean most of my friends that I disclose that to have the same reaction they're like what that doesn't make any sense but um anyway we still talk and he's still very creative and has written a few songs and i'm always like you know that he's he's the one in the family that got all the talent i'm just like catching up to him totally you know uh, i always feel like you know he's like at least 25 more percent more talented than i am at least you know I wouldn't go 50% more of it. <laughs> <laughs> but I got talent too, but yeah, you've got plenty of talent and and it really is, you know, whatever the goddess gives us, we really have to develop that talent and work on it and foster yeah. creativity. I thought I got it from the goddess. I like that. Yeah. But, you know, he, he when he was Roger and we were growing up and you know, bands like the Rolling Stones came out and uh, the Yardbirds. Um, we beco both became lead guitar fanatics by this age as teenagers. And we were trying to learn, you know, blues licks. And it was like those bands that appreciated the B.B. King and the Albert King and the Freddie King and, you know, Albert Collins and, you know, just all the all the different artists that were playing in the blues bands. And then we, you know, got into you know the people like elvin bishop that you know the american flag and you know just mike bloomfield and we just were like this is the coolest music in the world let's play this you know right and it for kids it was like easy to understand it was three chords right it was three chords and the truth and it was <laughs> the coolest actually i got that from harlan howard who's a country songwriter uh -huh. but that was his quote 
but it's really was three chords and you know there was a, you know then you found like a couple of more chords if you had a, a two chord in there and a six minor and if it was a minor changes you know to the blues but I don't know I just from there you know when Bob Dylan came out and I just wanted to learn how to play and sing all those songs by him and, and Joan Baez and and then I got into the country music from there. And my path has always been kind of what was, you know, whatever was cool and hip on the radio, I followed it. Like when Graham Parsons came through uh, with the Flying Burrito Brothers and I saw them in person and met him, uh, you know, I would just find people, mentors to follow and just study their music until, you know, I was tired of it, you know, and felt like, oh, okay, I got that, you know. All right, now I'm going to study Linda Ronstadt's vocals now. And I'll just lay on the ground, you know, take a hit of pot and lay on the ground and listen to <laughs> Linda Ronstadt sing and try and emulate her phrasing and pitch, you know. And so I was always really studying from the people that I admired. And, you know, from age, you know, from age seven, really, you know. Right. And so you, um, when was your first song complete? The one that I I wrote. You wrote and your brother helped you with it? Well, it was, I mean, that song, um, I don't even have a recording of it. Um, I'd have to look into my, I just recently, since I moved, um, have found a, a bunch of lyrics, like really old lyrics, you know, that I put them all in a plastic box in case some of them might be moldy. But um, I may be able to find it then. I was playing it for a while but it's been too long I, since I played it, so I can't remember it. But I did finish it that night. Okay, well, that's you know that's a big skill. Is you anybody can start a song, but it's actually completing it. I think. You're right. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah it, it takes. Um, and I used to hang out with you know professional songwriters in Nashville who were hit makers and like Guy Clark and John Prine and. You know, it was, you know, getting a song started was just as important as getting it finished, you know. Okay. Um, but it was like you can't wait too long in between. And that happened with me and Guy, me and a guy and I finished our song, but John and I never finished it. Oh, and really? And we kept saying, you know, like the last time I saw him in Canada was like, you know, next time you're in Nashville, let's finish that song. Let's, you know. And I never, you know, I never went back to Nashville. I was so caught up here with my residencies and the only time I went to Nashville was to do the uh, uh, Americana Festival last September and I was going to go back this September if it wasn't for the pandemic but um, you know I should have made that a priority you know John Prime wants to finish a damn song with me make that a priority girl you know what are you thinking <laughs> but you know who did finish it who? Uh, James McMurtry Oh, you wrote a song with James McMurtry? No, I said... Oh, you he, finished the actual song, the John Prine song, with James McMurtry? No. I'll say it again. You know who finished the song that John Prine and I started? Is? James, James McMurtry finished it for us. Okay, okay. <laughs> How's that? That's, uh, <laughs> that's beautiful. It was beautiful. But um, I have I haven't really jumped into it and performed it, but I'm getting ready to do a, you know I do a Three's a Charm every Wednesday. Do you know about my live stream every Wednesday? Um, let's uh, tell me and your and the listeners about it. Yeah, it's called Three's a Charm, and I only do three songs, mm -hmm. and I I pick a different artist every week to uh, highlight and make, do a tribute to. Like I've done the Beatles. Um, I've done the Everly Brothers. I'll do girl groups. You know, I did Memphis Memphis Mini. You know, I'll just pick an artist, or I'll just do Rosie Flores songs. Um, but coming up on November 18th, I'm going to do the three songs tribute to John Prine. So that would be a good time for me to, to get that song ready to perform. And, you know, once I dive into it and, uh, you know, take it, from you know pick it up where james finished it i may have to add some more of my own stuff into it too to you know i just i don't know where it's going to go um but 
I mean, he he really. I mean, if you just left it alone where he took it, it's it's pretty complete. You know, it's just me making it more my own if I want to. You know, absolutely. I always like that quote, the art is never finished, it just stops in interesting places. <laughs> Who said that? I like that. It was, uh, I believe, it was in Julia Cameron's book, The Artist's Way, I believe. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I just, I don't know if she said it or somebody else did, but that's where I got yeah. it. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> I mean, because you can keep on going. The only thing you, I have a hard time changing is my, my paintings, you know. Right, and that's got to be frustrating. Now, with the cataract, uh, oh, uh, <laughs> if you if you get the operation, they they're pretty confident you'll be able to see well. They're pretty confident that I can see far away, in the middle, and close up. Yeah, that's what we need, right? That I won't need to wear glasses because even now, you know, I can't wear my. I have to wear my reading glasses to see you right now. Okay, are you able to drive? I can, if you think it's a little bit blurry, I have uh, bifocals. Okay. But the signs are a little bit blurry. I certainly feel scared driving at night because the headlights are real bright. And I don't feel really safe because my peripheral vision isn't super. But I'm okay to drive in the daytime. Okay, so you can get your own groceries and stuff. I, um, I can pick up groceries from the back of the store. Gotcha. But I'm not allowed to go into the, into the stores or anywhere you know especially now since the bike has gone up but last year you know i was um unbeknownst to me i was living in a house that was covered in mold uh because of the vents the something happened in the air conditioning system where i don't know if it's when they put uh the what do you call that pink stuff up in the attic right um, um insulation insulation thank you mm -hmm. and it just didn't, uh, the moisture didn't have anywhere to go. So it ended up becoming, I think it always had kind of a problem because I ended up having a lot of bronchitis through the 15 years I lived there. But all of a sudden, I started getting really sick. And oh, wow. for most of the year, I was like every, every two or three months, I would get bronchitis and have to take antibiotics, you know. And I was having a hard time singing. And so I... Um, I, you know how I discovered it? How? Me and my friend Patricia Vaughn were getting ready for a, a July 4th picnic. And so she came to spend the night because we were going to get up early and go down there and set up. And um, I picked a guitar off my wall. I had like a wall of guitars. I thought nine guitars up there, you know. It was my pride and joy. Absolutely. And I, I picked up my, my Martin. It was covered with mold. And really? I'm like, oh, my God, there's mold all over my guitar. And we were both going, ew, you know, and I went, well, let me go get another one in it. And that one was filled with it, too. And I, I looked up close, you know, with my seeing glass, with mm -hmm. my reading glasses and and started seeing this fuzzy uh, greenish gray stuff everywhere. Wow. I saw it, I went in my bedroom and saw it on. I had my cowboy boots, my collection of cowboy boots displayed on top of my dresser and picked them up and inside the boots were green mold and underneath the boots on the soles it was like fuzzy oh and gross oh no so we told the landlord and she was um she had bought the place to help me out mm -hmm. you know and um so she's like get out of there tonight uh, okay i'll put you up in a hotel wow so she did that unfortunately Either my rent, neither my renter's insurance nor her homeowner's insurance covered mold. So she, uh, but she jumped in there and um, she really helped me. Uh, she uh, had the plate, she had my belongings remediated. And so they went in and pulled everything out and put it into storage. And then once I did, but five months later, um, I stayed with friends and five months later, um, I was able to move everything out of storage into the garage here. There happens to be a garage with a door. So um, I've been, you know, going through that. I'm still going through the process of opening stuff. And unfortunately, I found quite a few things that were still moldy, and I had to just throw them out, some expensive cowboy boots and stuff. Aww. But um, a lot, of, it doesn't matter. You know, it's all material. And, you know, I did save 
uh, I got all my clothes cleaned and I, you know, everything, you know, you can take your clothes to the cleaner and it kills mold and they were all washed by the company anyway. Um, so everything was safe. And I actually, uh, the other thing I wanted to plug, speaking of my wardrobe, okay. is I've been collecting my stage clothes forever, mm -hmm. uh, since way back when. And I'm, I have opened up an Etsy store <laughs> and I pulled out about, you know, nearly a hundred pieces. And my my Etsy store is called Rosie's Rock and Roll Rags. <laughs> Etsy's Rock and Roll, Rosie's Rock and Roll Rags. You can see what we have. Okay. And everything from, you know, vintage clothes, cowboy boots, jackets, you know, ornate, pretty ornate stuff. And I have a lot more stuff that we haven't even put up yet, but we're just, we're putting up a few pieces at a time. And um, we're, We've been working on my website right now. I, I'm not sure if it's up right now, but uh, you can go to my website and get the T-shirts. And um, there's not very many of my latest turquoise vinyl album left, maybe two left. Mm -hmm. um, I'm uh, parting with that record label, so I don't know that I can get any more stuff from them. Okay. Uh, but... Um, a lot of my other CDs are available, and uh, you know what else is available is the Janice Martin record that I produced, and the album is uh, Bubblegum Pink, and uh, <laughs> CDs available, and um, I also have a single um, that I recorded recently that's available that has a painting done by Lamar Sorrento. Um, I did a, I'm in the series of. Uh, uh, singles that this company out of San Francisco put out. So I got a bunch of those for sale. So if you want to help an artist that's struggling, trying to pay for her uh, cataract surgery and pay her rent and come to uh, the website, go to Etsy, Etsy's Rosie's Rock and Roll Rags and come to Three's a Charm on Wednesdays. And how, how will they watch that on Zoom? Nope, that's live at on Facebook, and it and it goes live from the Mule Kick Productions. It's at the at sign. Mm -hmm. It's at Mule Kick Productions. Okay, and they are my production team that have been helping me uh, so much um, to promote the shows. They share it with a lot of people. They design the little posters for me every week. They've just been. They've been my guardian angels, and they're really smart, and they're also really excited, and I'm excited for them because they're doing um, they're they're doing a documentary film right now. Okay. And, and actually, I'm wearing the T-shirt. You can't see it unless you're on Zoom, but it's called Palomania. Okay, and that's their documentary. And, yeah, it's called Palomania, and it's about the Palomino Club, where country music was very popular in North Hollywood, California. And that's where all the people like Buck Owens and Waylon Jennings and George Jones and where Dwight Yoakam and I got our start. And a bunch of people used to play there from, you know. And then later on after the country music, you know, when we were all doing country music, then it became songwriters like Dave Alvin and Lucinda Williams and, uh, you know, uh, gosh, Buddy Miller, Jim Lauderdale and... And a lot of Texas artists, Joe Ely, and uh, just a bunch of people. Sleep at the Wheel played there, so it was it was a grand place to cut my teeth on when I was just a young upstart songwriter and guitar player trying to to make a name for myself, you know. And so yeah, they're at Mule Kick Productions. So six thirty, okay. which is happy hour every um, Wednesday. Um, so what, uh, what time would that be? Yeah, Central Time Zone is 6.30 p.m. So if you're on the West Coast, it's going to be 4.30 p.m. Mm -hmm. And if you're in New York, it's going to be uh, 7.30 p.m. And if, if you're in Europe, you're like seven hours ahead. So you're like it's 1 o'clock in the morning or something. Um, maybe maybe they'll I'm, come home from the pub and turn, turn your, on your... Uh, I do have a fo some following from there, and um, on my birthday, I did um, I did an early show at noon, so a lot of people could see it, 
you know, around six or seven o'clock, depending upon whether you're in England or or Europe. And then um, and then I did my regular one at six thirty, and we did the live band. And and rather than because I do it solo, right. once in a while I do a duo. Who do you do the duo with? Well, I did um, I did the duo. Uh, firstly, with a, a wonderful drummer, a talented singer, and a songwriter, a guy named Chris Sensat. Chris okay. Sensat was the drummer for the Bell Furies and um, quite a few other really cool rock and roll bands, uh, you know, in the in the area. And he had uh, different bands, or he had learned just about all about him recently. And um, I, you know, I had him play with me a couple times not only did i i really like his drumming a lot mm-hmm. but i love that he could sing harmony yeah and so i asked him to do the everly brothers tribute with me and we ended up really liking how this one song called so sad sounded so we went into the studio and we recorded it with um his two guys that he has a little group with mike molnar on guitar and michael um Oh my God, I'm I'm blanking on his last name. I only met him once. Um, I'm sorry, Michael. The other Michael, I can him. Hard time remember his last name. It's on the tip of my tongue. But anyway, uh, I think we're going to release it as a single. Okay. So I don't know uh, where people will be able to download it. Hopefully, iTunes. Okay. And I think it's going to just be like a downloadable uh, song. But we're going in to record another song that I wrote. Um, I think on the 19th. So we may have two songs that we can actually press as a vinyl single if we wanted to. Um, I'm not sure. We're just enjoying recording together and singing together. So, and then the other person I had was one of my favorite female singers, uh, maybe one of my the favorite female singers is a woman named Marty Brown. And she's out of... Uh, here you should podcast her okay She's really interesting marty i could m-a-r-t-i like martini marty mm-hmm. yeah Brown. and um b-r-o-m you can find her on all the uh social platforms and, and her music she's uh come from a rockabilly from the rockabilly era and so after i produced the janice martin record uh Sadly, she passed away from Aww. cancer, and she never got to see the record come out. And it was a re- that's why it was a really hard record to get signed. So I had to Kickstarter it, and I had to raise all the money. And then I got a record label who jumped on the bandwagon and spent some more money, a uh, guy uh, from Cow Island Music. And so um, I think his record label folded, but I can still get it in a hold of the the merch. So Marty and I, she did my live stream with me and we did a special on Janice Martin. Uh, That was the last one I did. So we got Chris to come down and play some drums and guitar, Chris Sensat. So we actually had three people on my deck. But um, for the most part, I just do it solo. Right. Well, that's... um... This is so many good things that you're promoting. I I love it. Um... (laughs) Did you want to mention any career highlights that we haven't mentioned already? Like, what are some great things that have happened to me in my life? Yeah, I mean, just as a singer-songwriter, that, that, that you know, you're like, this thing. If, if you have anything else, it's, it's not a, a, you don't have to answer that, but. You don't have to brag. You can brag, though. <laughs> you can brag. I mean, you know, it's hard work. I'm one of the few artists uh, that has a Peabody Award. And I, what is the Peabody Award? The Peabody Award comes from uh, the Georgia State University. Um, they, it's really given to people that, you know, write, you know, incredible documentaries. Or it can be given to TV shows like the week... The you know like or somebody doing a documentary on the Vietnam War. It has to be something that's significant and a lot of people can learn from, and be kind of educational, I believe. 
And um, do you know that who won it while I, I went um, to go accept the award with Lex Gillespie, who wrote the documentary? It was an audio documentary. It, it was on the history of rockabilly. Aww. And it was 10 hours. And I was the voice. I was the announcer of it. And I told the story. Wow. So um, it took several months to do 10 hours worth. But they played it on a lot of radio stations through the United States. And uh, it's called A Whole Lot of Shaken. Okay. And you can find it if you go to rockabillyradio.org. O-R-G. Rockabilly and all 10 out. Radio.org. That's right. Mm-hmm. And a whole lot of. It's called. A whole lot of shaking. Got it. Okay, cool. And um, yeah, if you go there, you can listen to one hour at a time and pause it and go back to it. It's fun to listen to while you're cooking dinner or whatever and, or driving in the car because it's it's really, it's but so well researched. This, this is the second Peabody Award that Lex Gillespie won. He won another one on Rhythm and Blues. And it's just so educational. You find out a lot about, you know, Elvis or right. Jerry Lowe or the guitar players of the era and all, all that era in the in the fifties uh, and all the women singers and Wanda Jackson and Janice Martin and Brenda Lee. You know, and that every segment is a different highlight of the rockabilly era. Oh wow, you know? that's cool. From Jerry Lee to songwriters, you know, just everything in between, and so yeah, that that was fun to win that award. And but yeah. I, I was just about to tell you, sorry, I got sidetracked. Um, a couple of the other uh, winners were Thirty Rock oh. <laughs> won a Peabody Award, and Mad Men won a Peabody Award. So the cast of both those TV shows were there. Oh wow! And, you got to meet Tina, Tina Fey. I'm really shy. I didn't meet anybody. Actually, the what was the guy's name? I don't know his real name, but he was the the white haired, spiky guy that worked with. Um, he was in the, the office with the, uh, the the John guy character, um, the handsome one, <laughs> the, the handsome one who had the fake name. It's been so long since I've watched it. I'm not remembering their names, but anyway, the um, the guy with the uh, white spiky hair came up to me and he complimented me on my speech. Oh, so I was like, oh, that's sweet, you know. Yeah. But um, okay, what else did I do? Um, well, I I produced Janice Martin and I helped Wanda Jackson uh, come out of retirement and put a tour together uh, in a band and back backing band behind her um and we went out on the road for six weeks and we made our zigzag across from california to new york and back and we had some some bad things happen around it um uh you know i know you were interested in you know what cautionary tales i might have but uh, <laughs> do you want to share that one or not well i mean you know, the lesson I learned in it is, you know, don't think you can trust everybody. You know, check up on check up on your agencies. If you've just made, met a new agency, find out how they tick. Yeah. You know, I was putting my money in his personal account and didn't pay his taxes. So the IRS put a lien on his account. I got ripped off for $20,000. Oh, my gosh. That's horrible. To pay my band by myself. You know, so I joined Asleep at the Wheel and, you know, used that money to pay them back. And I did get, uh, the Musicians Union did help, but they only got a, um, they only got, uh, what do you call it? They, they just drew a, well, what's the word for it? Um, they got, well, basically they got 13000 for them. They settled. Okay. A settlement, this is the word. Settlement for thirteen thousand, and then he wouldn't pay it. So I had to go and get a um, attorney from San Francisco. So I met this great attorney. Oh my God, he was like Austin Powers. He was like, 
being so into Austin Powers, you'd go, hey, baby. And he would be like, oh, behave and all that stuff. And he would just like personify, <laughs> you know, and he was just so funny. But he became a really dear friend of mine and he got his firm to get a hard ass guy at the firm to go and shake the money down out of his pockets and so and then the rest of it I just had to suffer through and just pay it because I didn't want you know my band to not get paid for as hard as they worked you know so I you know and I my image and as a businesswoman is you know yeah if I say I'm going to pay you this much I'm going to pay you this much you know I'm always been a really good businesswoman and I I will never screw anybody over, you know. So there you go. Well, that that wrapped up those couple of questions, and then uh, <laughs> well, let's get to the the um the song you brought in today. It's called oh, Lennon's Dream. Lennon's Dream, and you recorded it when? I recorded that. Uh, you would have to ask me to remember dates. Well, it was in two thousand nineteen, and I believe. Um, Bonnie Montgomery and I did it. It was kind of toward maybe maybe it was in the fall. Maybe it was uh, the end of the summer and uh, beginning of fall maybe. And we, uh, she really wanted to uh, work at Yellow Yellow Dog Studios, and because um, she moved out to uh, uh, Wimberley, and uh, I, I'm just a really huge fan of Bonnie Montgomery. You should put her on your podcast. Okay. She's uh, a very eloquent speaker, songwriter. She's just come out and they just did a, uh, uh, the, the dictionary of um, Arkansas put her in it and a big write up on her. And she's, she's done everything from written an opera about Bill Clinton when he was a little boy to, <laughs> you know, writing, you know, the greatest country music. She hasn't hit the big time in a way that she deserves to yet. But that's not to say she's, you know, she's like Buck Owens used to tell me, you're just a song away. Well, I feel that way about Bonnie. She's a song away, you know. And um, anyway, so we started, you know, we were, it was right around the time uh, the, um, the woman, the young girl was, trying to fight for climate change and oh, yeah. um, the Indians were fighting to get their land back and and Bonnie was there in person and so the song kind of came out of that and then when I got involved it sort of took on this kind of John Lennon um, turn you know and we ended up that's how it has all we were saying is give peace a chance you know and I ended up saying like John Lennon said just give peace a chance you know and so um, we wrote it together. We recorded, you know, I sang a verse and I got to play all this badass rock and roll guitar on it. And So you're, you're the one that does this, the guitar solo? Mm-hmm. And okay. the intro. I was going to ask you, well, <laughs> at this point, I'm going to ask you to just pause because we're going to play okay. your song for the listeners. Ah, thank you.
was so great. I, I really enjoy that song. There's a, so many cool references, and it yeah. again, it kind of it brings up the mood of uh, the new administration. You know, it, it's a great song to kind of kick off the year with. I think so. It it's it gives it's a uh, hopeful and. I mean, really, all we're saying is just give peace a chance. And, you know, it's, you know, all you need is love and, you know, love each other and, you know, respect other people's religions and color of their skin. Don't be haters. You know, there's there's no room in in God's country for racism. There's just no, it's, it's not cool. Uh, you know, you don't yeah. need that. We don't need to have that normalized. That is just wrong. And if we're be going to become the United States of America instead of the divided States of America, that's what we, we have to concentrate on listening to each other and letting each other have a voice. Because sometimes somebody, all they need is just to be heard and understood. And then they get that out of their system and then they go, oh, and then you go, yeah, well, this is how I feel. And then maybe you teach them something, you know, that calms them down a little bit. You know, if you have a blister on your arm and you keep scratching it, it's going to get redder and sore and more infected. But if you leave it alone and cool it down, put a little ice on it, it goes away. Another one of my crazy analogies for you, folks. That's okay. <laughs> we love crazy analogies around here. So, uh <laughs> Well, let's just reiterate, which uh, you, I, I'm going to have a bunch of show notes for you. So uh, uh, first first off, your website is? Uh, com, And my name is spelled R-O-S-I-E. F is in Frank, L-O-R-E-S is in Sam. Rosie Flores. Rosie Flores. Dot com. That's... Rosie sounds like it'd be R O Z I E, <laughs> but it's Rosie, I guess. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. I, I used to have a friend in high school that used to tease me about that because I would say, "My last name is with an S, Flores, not Flores, right. because they're F L O R E Z's in the phone book." But I'm a Flores, so she said, "Well, shouldn't your name be pronounced Rosie?" Oh, <laughs> <laughs> call me. Rosie, how are you, Rosie Flores? So that was one of my old uh, friends teasing me. <laughs> that's cute. Like whatever. <laughs> yeah. No, no, that's that's uh, <laughs> little little taste of the past. So uh, <laughs> yeah, and uh, okay. So the other things are going to be our uh, the happy hour threes at charm, which is live on Facebook on. Uh, Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. Central Time. You can and, go there at Mule Kick Productions. Okay, so you just look that up on at Mule Kick Productions on Facebook. It's a live stream. Well, is there anything else we haven't covered that you think we should add? I would like all the female musicians out there that are working hard on your careers to, you know, use me as an example of somebody that might not have ever hit, you know, the big jack, you know, jackpot in the sky and made, you know, the big money. Uh, that that's no reason to not keep going and to keep creating. And you know, it's it part of why you do it is to fill your heart, uh, to keep yourself happy, to find, you know, when when you're a creative person, you do that because you were given this talent, you know, and you kind of have to do it to keep yourself sane, you know, and happy. And, you know, if you're lucky and you're smart and you have the right business people around you, then you have a better chance of, uh, you know, making a financial, you know, business and make, doing well. Um, but most creative per people, persons, you know, whatever, like me, really need to have a business person around them. Uh, especially if you're super artistic, it's it's hard to have both sides of the brain working for you. So, you know, don't give up. Stay, stay working on your creativity and do spend some time 
uh, studying the business and trying to find people that uh, you can trust to work on that for you and guide you and, you know, make that an important part if, if you want to make this, you know, a living that you want to do. There's a lot of ways to uh, get get that going, you know, but ultimately you want to master your craft and keep all the negative people out of your life and get up early in the morning and do it. Don't be lazy. I love that. That is a great thought to end on, Rosie Flores. Thank you so very much. I'm glad we finally got to do this. Yeah, we've been talking about it for a long time. It was wonderful to meet you here on Zoom, and I'll see you out and about someday. Yes, yeah, someday when there's a vaccine, we might have some gigs again. <laughs> yeah. And today, there's one that looks like it has 90%, uh, you know, positive, uh, you know, that it's really working. Um, so maybe if it's 90% working, that maybe that's, we're getting a whole lot closer to it. But, you know, you just want to be careful. You don't, you don't want to find out later that it's going to, you know, cause blindness five years down the line or, you right. know, you just, you just don't know what the after effects will be, um, or something, you know, so, but we keep our fingers crossed and, and try and think positive, don't we? Yes, exactly. Yeah. We're the Hopeful Sisters. All right, Hopeful Sisters. Fantastic. <laughs> well, yeah. I hope you have a wonderful day after all this. And Thank you. I've got I, some good stuff planned. I yeah. hope you do too. Oh, I do. Awesome. Yeah. Yay. Right. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, you're quite welcome. Bye for now. Okay, bye, G5. Bye, Rosie. Bye. <laughs> yeah.